watching Channel 20 TV. Be with Channel 20 and let us make things better together. Dear guests, we'd like to welcome you for our special episode today. And today we have gone with us uh, Gustav Solstrand from, uh, you know, the Nobel Foundation. He is the Nobel Prize historian. So we'll try to know a lot of information from him regarding the Nobel, Nobel Prize and its background. So hopefully it's going to be beneficial for you. So let us welcome Gustav Solstrand. How are you, Gustav? Hi, fine. Thank you for having me on your program. Thank you, okay. thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you, it is indeed. And I know you had a very, very busy time all of you recently regarding the Nobel Prize 2020 announcement. So I would like to start a little bit from the background. Um, can you just tell us uh, for our audience, when did you start this Nobel Prize? When it started, a little bit the background of this Nobel Prize? Yes, the, the first Nobel Prizes were awarded in 1901. So 120 years ago, basically. And they were founded in the will of, of uh, the inventor of dynamite, Alfred Nobel, who was a Swedish inventor who invented dynamite and became quite rich. And after he died, he left a will. And in that will, he said that he, all of his fortune, almost all of his fortune should be made into a fund. And the interest from that fund should be awarded as prizes to people who had, as he put it, conferred the greatest benefit to mankind in the fields of physics, chemistry, medicine, physiology or medicine, literature, and peace. And, and he died, when he died in 1896, the, the process to start these prizes began, and it took a couple of years to set everything up to get a system for, for finding the right candidates and the right nominees mm -hmm. and evaluating the candidates. But in 1901, the prizes were first awarded. So it's a quite quite a long history to be going on for 120 years and still have i think that the status of the price has only increased over those years yeah that's true no doubt about it so now gusto i'd like to just know a little bit in clear way uh, for the sake of our audience who owns the nobel foundation is it a charity organization is it non-profit seeking organization or is it family business can you just a little bit elaborate yeah, well, the Nobel Foundation is a, it's a private foundation, uh, so it's, uh, uh, it, it was set up when Alfred Nobel died. Uh, he left his money for this prize, but someone had to manage the money, so this, fu this foundation was created. So it's a non-profit uh, private uh, foundation that, that deals with this money, uh, that, and they're the Nobel Foundation, their job is to invest the money that Alfred Nobel left. So again, it's the interest from this money that goes into the prices. So, so the fortune of Alfred Nobel is still there. It's actually increasing uh, year after year. So, so the price sum is a, is a fraction, is part of the interest from the, mm -hmm. uh, from the f foundation's money. And that means that the, the sum of the Nobel Prize can go up and down depending on the, on the financial markets. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, so, so it, and it's quite important for, for, for the prize that the Nobel Foundation is an, private inst uh, institution, it's not, it's non-governmental, so it's not connected to the Swedish or the Norwegian governments in any way. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Whenever you just mention me, Swedish or Norwegian government, they have nothing to do. It's a private initiative. Now, a little bit, uh, you know, question that uh, why it's related with Sweden, Norway. I mean, what's the mm. country of origin of this Nobel Foundation? Is it Norway or it's in uh, Stockholm. Actually, the will of Alfred Nobel was written in Paris. So it, because <laughs> Nobel, Nobel was a very international person. He lived in several countries, mostly in Europe, but, uh, but he was born in Stockholm. <gasps> and uh, when he wrote his will, he wanted uh, uh, Swedish, and this is where it gets a bit complicated, or not, well, I say actually also this is where it gets interesting because Alfred Nobel wanted, um, he didn't know about the Nobel Foundation because that was set up after he died. What he did in his will was to ask different organizations to give out the prizes. He wanted experts in these different fields. So for, for science prizes, for the prize of physics and chemistry, it's the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, uh, for example. 
and for literature is the Swedish Academy of Literature and for medicine is the Karolinska Institute, which is a medical school here in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. And for, for the Peace Prize, it's the Norwegian Nobel Institute, which is, which is a, a group of five people appointed by the Norwegian parliament. Mm -hmm. So we don't know exactly why he chose this. Uh, this is Sweden. He could have chosen the French Academy, for example, since he lived in, in Paris. He could have chosen the, the well, some academy in Italy where he also lived. But he chose Sweden probably because he felt some ties to it. It could be that he, was, he had the foresight to understand that it would be more, it would be good for a prize of this kind, an international prize, mm. to be given out by a small and neutral country rather than um, uh, one of the great powers of Europe. Because what mm. we know, one of the things that the prize made the prize uh, famous is that, again, it's, it's, it's international. He wrote that anyone could get the prize regardless of nationality. But let's say in 1901, for example, that a German scientist would have gotten the prize. If the French had given it out, the Germans would say, this is not a good prize. They just award it to themselves. Mm -hmm. But what happened now is that since there are several categories, so there was one, there was a French writer who got it, and there was a Dutch uh, a chemist, and there was a, a German physicist. So there were people from all over, so it be became more neutral, so it became more international. So that mm -hmm. could have been one of, one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. But I should also explain the reason why it's, Sweden and Norway. At the time when Alfred Nobel died, Sweden and Norway were, wasn't, they weren't two separate countries. Mm -hmm. They were dual monarchies. So Sweden, the Swedish king was the king of both Sweden and Norway. But no, the Norwegians all had their own parliament. Oh, I see. Uh, but but they, were still, they weren't completely sovereign. So it's logical for him to sort of mm -hmm. choose between the institutions in both of these countries. Mm -hmm. Now, uh... I reckon this is the first ever in the history of Nobel Prize that, you know, the laureates are not gathering together, journalists are not crowded all over your, you know, hall or the conference room. This time it's a different experience due to the pandemic, due to the COVID-19. So if you could share with us, how's your experience in the, you know, 5th to 12th of October? How did you feel? I'm sure it's a different experience, but how's your reaction? After all, we are the human being. Well, actually, though these days, the 5th to 12th of October, this week of announcing the new Nobel Prizes, hasn't been that different. Mm -hmm. Because this week, what usually happens is exactly this, that the different prize awarding institutions have their meetings where they decide who will get the Nobel Prize, and then they announce it to the world. So it's basically just a series of press conferences. Mm -hmm. And while those have been smaller, if you're not there, it doesn't matter to you, you, you won't know the difference. So I think that, and I think this is really important, because what, what, what is the difference this year is that the Nobel laureates will not be able to come to Stockholm in mm -hmm. or, and Oslo in December to accept their prizes. And while well, that's something that we find, I mean, it's, we're sorry that that has to happen, but of course it's, it's nothing, nothing to do about it. But I think what people was worried about in the, earlier in this year was, will the Nobel committees be able to have their meetings, to, have their, um, to continue their work in such a way that they will be able to award prizes? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, so, so for, I think for everyone involved, if there were a little bit fewer people at the press conferences, that's fine, because what we were really relieved about was that we were able to, everyone was able to keep up the meetings, find new ways of meeting and evaluate the candidates. And we don't know exactly how this happened because everything is secret, but apparently, evidently they found way. And they would not have given out the prizes if they weren't sure that they had uh, had a, a thorough evaluation process, because so mm -hmm. much is at stake for the prize awarding institutions, their prestige, they can't make sort of a half-baked decision. They have to be absolutely certain. So. I think this is, for me, this is not, year was not a disappointment or something, rather it was um, a source of maybe even pride to see that, that these institutions really pulled together because this is a year where it matters to show that science uh, affects our lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in a situation right now with the pandemic where, where of course, everyone is is hoping for, for science to come through with a vaccine or, or, or treatments. But I think we should also not forget the fact that, that how terrible as this pandemic is, mm. there is, this is probably the best time in the history of the world to have a pandemic because we know so much. For example, I mean, we have, 
sequence the genome of the virus and so on, who know everything about that. And we, we do hope for a virus with it, for, for a vaccine within a year. Mm -hmm. But also, we also think very much about this high tech science. We should also remember that for the last 150 years, we've known about washing our hands. <laughs> that's, that's probably something that has saved as many lives. Hygiene has probably saved more lives than maybe even penicillin. So, mm -hmm. so we, we live in a time where our knowledge of the world, we really see that from, from the very big things like vaccines to the small things like washing our hands, we see that science really affects our lives. And I think that the Nobel Prize is a symbol for that that people recognize. So I, I think it's very good that we were able to give out the prizes this year. Mm -hmm. That sounds good and uh, realistic. Now the question is why six categories? Why not why not more categories? Why not mm. less categories? Who decides this? Who is the big daddy? Who you know, yeah. makes this decision? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think that that what the Nobel Prize has become, which is now this big symbol for science, and it's an important institution of science. And we know that for the fields that are rewarded, this prize comes with, with a lot of attention. And if you're working in a field and that field gets the Nobel Prize, they will get more attention, maybe possibly more research money, research grants and so on. So if the Nobel Prize was set up as a, as a way of um, uh, shedding light on different fields, yeah, there should probably be more categories because we could do much good. But that's not the point of the Nobel Prize. That's the, uh, because the Nobel Prize was started by Alfred Nobel in his will, which he wrote in 1895 and he died in 1896. He decided that we should have these categories. Mm -hmm. So it's based on the, this prize that has become so big and so important for so many people is based on what one person um, sitting in Paris in 1895 thought were the five most interesting subjects that he liked. I mean, he was a scientist, he was a chemist, so he liked chemistry and physics. He was, uh, he thought that science could improve, um, um, improved, could contribute to benefit for mankind. So he thought that medicine is a good way to do that, very obvious. Um, actually, we know that one of, the, one of his first, when he started thinking about creating a prize, the very first idea he had was to create the prize for people who early on gave early warnings for outbreaks, epidemic outbreaks. Mm -hmm. So medicine was er early on his mind. And his literature prize, well, we know, know that when he was young, he wanted to be a poet. So he was interested in literature. And the peace prize, well, he was, this was seen as contradictory because he was um, he manufactured weapons and explosives. But he was actually also philosophically interested in he believed that, that um, well, he believed, one thing he believed was that if you create more powerful weapons, people mm -hmm. won't make war. So um, the kind of determined theory, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, many people have held after this as well. Uh, but he also, uh, he also thought that, that peace is, a, is something that follows from rational thinking that is linked mm -hmm. to science as well. So people realize that peace is more rational than, than war. But again, he chose this and there's nothing that, that the Nobel uh, foundation can do to add more prices. What has happened it was in, in 1969, um, the Swedish uh, National Bank, Sveriges Riksbank, created the Prize for Economic Science, which the Nobel Prize, found, the Nobel Foundation, allowed to be included in, in what we can say the family of the Nobel Prizes. It's a memorial award to Alfred Nobel, but it's not a new Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And they did this, and they're not quite sure whether or not they should. Uh, or rather, they're quite sure that they should not uh, do any more of this mm -hmm. new prices. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if I go, go back to my, uh, you know, a little bit supplementary question regarding this. Uh, yes. How many members are all together involved currently, if it is like different committees for mm -hmm. the six categories? What's the total number currently you have as a member? Well, the total is several hundred, but that's not really interesting. The interesting is you have to break it down by categories. Mm -hmm. um, because, well, one thing, because there are different price awarding institutions that has different um, numbers of members. Mm -hmm. And for, let's say, for, we can start with, with the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. They give out the price for physics, chemistry, and then since 1969, the Memorial Award in Economic Sciences. Mm -hmm. They have several hundred members. Mm -hmm. um, about 600 or so, but not all of them, are, of course, are physicists. <laughs> uh, uh, so what they do is they appoint a Nobel committee of five people I and see. one secretary, and they do the work of evaluating the committee and, of course, take help from other experts and so on. And they do the work, are responsible for the work of evaluating the candidates, 
and then they then present who they think should get their award to the rest of the physicists in this academy, which can be a bit more, and then the whole academy votes. But it's, so it's a fairly small committee. Uh, for the medicine prize, it's the it's a group called the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute, this medical school, and they are 40 members. But they also appoint a Nobel committee to do the groundwork, but then there are 40 members. All of them are, me are medical scientists. So then they can have maybe broader discussion in this bigger group. So that's the second biggest. Then for the, for the Swedish Academy of Literature that gives out the Literature Prize, there are 18 members. Mm. One eight. So one 18. And they have, um, again, also a Nobel committee of five that, that make the groundwork, but then all 18 are, are can share in the discussion and all 18 can make the final decision. For the, the last category, uh, the Peace Prize, that's a committee of five. They're appointed by the Norwegian Parliament, but the Norwegian Parliament doesn't have anything to do with who gets the prize. So in that case, the committee and the prize awarding institution are the same. So those five people give the prize. So, mm -hmm. so it's no easy answer to your question because uh, the, the Physics Prize has several hundred people who actually decide. The, phys, the Peace Prize is five people. But for each of these, there, there is a committee of five people who are, are mainly responsible for doing the work. Uh -huh. Now, a little bit if I just refer to the financial part, is this a voluntary job, uh, especially the Nobel Committee members they're performing, or they get some sort of support from a Nobel Foundation? Um, they, well, it, it is voluntary, <laughs> it's not a, but, but it's not, they, they get, uh, um, some remuneration, they get a little bit of money for it. It's not, but, it's, but it's, what's important is uh, because it takes some time for, for them, but it's not, um, um, it's not a full-time job. And that's, that's really important because uh, the members of these committees are all scientists in their fields and uh, usually quite uh, prominent, the leading scientists in these mm. fields so that they know what's going on in their fields and they have lots of contacts and they know who to trust and they're able to judge these um, uh, the nominees so and that's really important that all the members sh should be active scientists so mm. this is just part of their work to do this it's mm. probably one of the most uh, of, of all the committees that these scientists are on this is probably the one that they uh, work hardest on and take mm. more seriously so I, I would assume that if you if you become a member of a Nobel Committee, you would probably sort of uh, take a break from some of your other committee work. But it is, it, it, it is still something you do beside your ordinary job. And I think that's really um, quite important. Yeah, and prestigious indeed. So I'd like to know when normally the process starts, for example, this year the announcement was done between 5th and 12th of October. So mm. when did you start this uh, process for 2020? Is it like a couple of months earlier or how does it work? Well, it actually, uh, we announced or the committees announced the prize in uh, now in October for 2020. The work to find the laureates for 2021 has already started. It started in September. Because in September each year, the Nobel committees send out letters to people, experts in these fields all over the world and ask them for nominations. Mm -hmm. So not anyone can nominate for a Nobel Prize. You have to be invited by the committee or some people have the automatic right always to nominate. For example, mm -hmm. if you're a previous Nobel laureate, you can nominate in your field. So that's done in, December, in September. But then, then they can focus on this year's laureate because uh, in the last of January, all the committees, all the nominations have to be received by the committee. So on February 1st, they can have their first meeting. Mm -hmm. So the process then goes from, from, from during the spring uh, to the to, uh, first week of October. Mm -hmm. But I think it's um, quite important that it's not, um, um, it's not the case that this starts from scratch every year the people who are nominated again it's secret so we don't know exactly the names but 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 we do know they have said so as much as this the committee members that that um, this process doesn't start from scratch the people who get the prize uh, this year have probably been nominated for for several years in a row and that means that they have been evaluated um several years in a row so they have a good sense of who's nominated mm -hmm. because they, what, what they do then the committees is is they they do very thorough investigations of the candidates and of the prize and they have 
for science practice, they have three, which is, I think, easiest to talk about. They have three criteria. The mm -hmm. first is that if you, let's say, for example, this year's chemistry prize, the, the gene editing tool, the CRISPR. So first of all, they have to realize, is this correct? Does it work? Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes, I mean, you have to wait a few years after the breakthrough discovery, you have to wait a few years to make sure that it actually, something isn't wrong with it or so on. So maybe they do that. After that, when that's a certain, they have to make sure that is this influential? You may think when something breaks through that this will be really influential, but maybe it turns out it wasn't that useful. Mm -hmm. And then in this case, they have a problem sometime during these years, since the discovery in 2012 to this year, they have discovered that, yeah, it is, this is really influential, which is obvious that it is. But then come the third and maybe hardest part, they have to find one, two or three people to award the prize. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I mean, it's always, in a sense, unfair the Nobel Prize because there's almost always someone else that could be included or, or and if nothing else, everyone who's worked on this has lots of assistance and it's, it's not a researcher. It's not, maybe it was 100 years ago, there was one researcher doing a, making a discovery. Mm -hmm. Now it's a researcher group. So maybe, so, so it's always someone left out. But mm -hmm. what the committee is thinking about isn't to make it fair because it's, that's very hard, but what they try to make sure is, or they have to make sure is that the person who gets the prize really deserves it. So they have to make sure that these were really involved. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they try to formulate the motivation so that, that it sort of narrows it down to these people. And in this case, they found uh, with uh, Jennifer Dauda and Emmanuel Chapantier, and they thought that these are the most, these people were clearly involved in this discovery. Mm -hmm. um, and they've formulated the motivation so that it really looks at their work. There may be controversies. There's always that to someone else say, well, I did this, which was important, and I did this. And, and sure, but then the committee always tried to make sure that well, the, the way we formulated the prize, we left your work outside of this. So, so but it can still be controversies that it happened in the past. Maybe it will happen this year. Maybe it will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. but, but that's what they do. So to make sure that the idea is correct, that the idea is influential and that they can identify people. If it was the case mm -hmm. that you had like a scientific paper written by that discovered, you know, new life in the universe and it was written by four people, that would be a real dile dilemma because they can't give the Nobel Prize to four people. And if four people have made an equal share in something that obviously deserves the Nobel Prize, that could be a problem. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I'm not on the Nobel Committee. It seems like a hard job. <laughs> Yeah, now I would like to put you in a little bit typical situation and I'm going to ask you a red hot chili pepper question. For example, this year, as you said, like every year from September, the process starts for the next year mm. until January, they're all ready and 1st February, they start meeting oh, for finalizing the process. Suppose for this year, you decided that, okay, hepatitis C will mm. get work for medicine. Just imagine, um, say last week of September, world experienced the vaccine for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Do you reckon the decision could have been changed that no, let's give the prize to that particular pharmaceutical company or that particular body or organization or the person mm -hmm. who invented the medicine? That means what I'm, I'm going to ask you, that is it possible to change the decision in the very last well, that's a very easy answer, uh, probably a very quite easy answer uh, that I can elaborate. But the answer is a very definite probably no, <laughs> because well, because for for first couple of reasons. First of all, the Hill status of the price depends on the thorough process. Mm -hmm. So you can't do that in a week, even if you would have uh, like a vaccine for COVID nineteen. You still have to th these questions: Is it correct? Well, I think it would be really hard to, make, to, to have that short notice. But let's show that it was beyond the doubt correct. Well, is it influential? Well, yeah, sure. But, but then again, if it, it's really for the benefit of mankind. But, but then is it, is it scientifically influential? Was it a new method used or was it just the same old methods that were mm. produced? But, so that, that's a difficult evaluation. But, but the third thing is, do we, can we find the right people? And that, I think, would be the hardest part. But... But, that's, but that maybe could be solved by the committees. They're good people. But the real problem is a technical problem. And that's the fact that in order to get the prize this year, you have to be nominated by the end of January. So if that person is not nominated by the end of January, you can't give them the prize in September, even if they do something great. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, 
you are nominated for the work that you've done up, up, up to then. We haven't seen anything break like that big, but we have seen, for example, when um, a few years ago, gravity waves were, were discovered. Um, they were discovered, and I'm struggling to remember the year which they got the prize. I think they got the prize in 2016. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, they got the, 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 the year before the prize they were discovered, and they were discovered in March, or it was published in March which means that we're one month too late. So no one was, they couldn't be awarded that year. So everyone thought that, I mean, the speculations was, because this was something that everyone realized this will get the Nobel Prize because it's discovered gravity waves. We have been waiting for this since Einstein for hundred years. So we should really have a, a Nobel Prize for this. And of course they did get the prize, but uh, the discovery was in March. So they couldn't get the same year that the discovery was made, even though it was a big breakthrough. But the next year, of course, it was, it was the only time that I guessed the Nobel Prize correctly <laughs> because, <laughs> because everyone, everyone guessed uh, gravity waves. Uh, so that was, um, uh, yeah, and I think that this, the Higgs boson might have been the same situation where they have to wait one year just to make sure that, that uh, the nomination time ran out uh, for them. So, so again, the only exception to this, and it's always this case with the Nobel Prize, it always gets a little bit complicated, mm -hmm. that is the Peace Prize. They give the prize for, for work done up until the day when they dis, make the decision. Oh, uh, however, you still have to be nominated that year. Uh, so if someone created, I don't know, maybe that could be, if you have a, a vaccine for COVID, maybe that could be a peace prize. Well, if that, if like whoever did made that invention or whichever organization made that invention, was already nominated in January, they could get the prize the same year, but not in the science prize. Oh, yes. there, is actually, there is actually one very good example of this, which the Nobel Committee in Norway has talked about, and that is the prize in 1978 to um, Anwar al-Sadat and Menachem Begin, who got the prize in, for the um, uh, Camp David in 1978, which was sort of uh, the negotiations were led by Jimmy Carter. And in 1978, this, the, the agreement was made sometime, I think in September or maybe even early October. Uh, and they, they wanted to give the prize the same year on such short notice. And they gave the prize, but, they, but uh, Carter was not nominated that year. Luckily for them, Salat and Begin were. So they could get the prize, but Carter wasn't. So he didn't get the prize in 1978. Mm. He did get the prize in 2000, I think it was 2003 or 2004 instead. But, mm. but so that has one, been one case in the Peace Prize where, where they actually gave press a very short notice, but it led to someone being left out who might have been, they, we know not for sure they, we, he would have been in if he was nominated, but he wasn't nominated. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let me just stick you to the critics perspective, you know, mm -hmm. for any, uh, you know, announcement of the prize, there's room for criticism. I would yep. like to ask you, is there any criticism for the Nobel Prize? Do you think Oh, we have some criticism. We have some critics who always, you know, criticize us in a particular area. Or I can ask you in another way, uh, Alfred Nobel, he is a European guy. He was a European. Hmm. You reckon that sometime critics might think, oh, Nobel Prize, it's European biased or non-European. I mean, is there any specific criticism that you have come across so far? Yeah, well, there's, of course, lots of criticism and one thing that I think is important for the prize is it's when it comes to specific criticism that someone should have gotten this prize or, you know, this person should have shared this prize or this person mm -hmm. should not have gotten it and so on. Those kinds of criticisms, I think, historically has only benefited the prize because it means that people care. Uh, and I think a more dangerous uh, thing would be if someone said, if, if people would just not bother with the, who got the prize, but, but saying that someone being angry because no one, someone did not deserve the prize or someone did not get the prize. It means that you just care about the prize. So those kinds of, of, when it comes to individual decisions, those kinds of criticism and controversies can actually, has probably just made the prize more, um, um, well, I, it has made the prize more uh, up to date maybe or more uh, something to care about. But mm -hmm. when it comes to, like you are we're talking about also more systemic criticism, criticism of the fact, is it European biased? biased? Is it, um, and also gender biased, of course. Those criticisms are more valid. And when it comes to, and more problematic, 
Um, and I think when it comes to the first question, Nobel was a European, but he was also being a European, he was still international in the sense that he didn't, he didn't only award the prize to Swedes, he, he included, he, he wanted the prize to be international. And uh, so, so that is the, the ethos of the prize, it should be international. Mm -hmm. and, and what makes the prize international, obviously it's awarded by five or, or you know, a committee of five, usually Swedish or at least maybe Scandinavian, maybe you know, American scientists, but all, everyone is scientists living in Sweden. That makes it very provincial, very Swedish. But what makes it international is that the nomination system is international. You get nomination from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I know that members of, of some Nobel committees have said in science have said that th there is a problem that, for example, we don't know enough what's going on in certain parts of the world. We ask for nominations, for example, they ask for more nominations from China mm -hmm. and they are not getting too many nominations from there. So, so maybe there is work going on that they, they may be not aware of because of language barriers and so on mm -hmm. but but even that said i think in science the, the bias is still i mean the most obvious thing right now is that most nobel laureates uh, live in the united states mm -hmm. and have done so since the second world war however what's important to remember is that that most all, all of these nobel laureates are not born in the united states mm -hmm. and uh, the reason why the united states have so many nobel laureates is that they have universities that are very good Mm -hmm. And that get people, and they, they, they have a long history of accepting people from all over the world into their universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, they are, have a lot of money. So if you have a lot of money for research and you welcome talent from all over the world, that's, um, uh, that's the way to get a Nobel Prize. But again, people who are, uh, it doesn't matter where you're born, you have people that work in the United States, born in, in, in all continents, and, and mm -hmm. very, 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 very often, the, mem the people who are, are, when they come to Stockholm to get the Nobel Prizes, it's people with dual or even triple citizenships. Yep, yep. So, so science is international. I heard um, one of the Nobel laureates a few years ago, he worked in uh, Manchester, it was called Fraser Stoddart, he worked in Manchester. And he was mm -hmm. critiqued in Manchester in the, in the 70s and 80s because he started his research groups, his group, and he accepted lots of uh, young scientists into his group from came from Italy and from the Mediterranean uh, area and so on. Uh, and they, people said, well, why don't you employ British scientists? We have scientists here who want to work. Why don't you employ? And he said, well, I don't care where people come from. I want people who are devoted to science. And if you are willing to move from the Mediterranean to Manchester, you are devoted to science. <laughs> that was his explanation. But, but, but I think, uh, so the big problem there is, of course, the, the Nobel committees are very well aware that they that they, they don't want to miss out on this. And of mm -hmm. course, there is a problem in the world that, that many people don't have access to, to, well, basic education, of course, but even further on to higher education of, the, of this quality that, that will allow them to, to move on to these great universities. But our best hope is, for one, for one thing, is that people, even from, from, from countries where with, today have smaller opportunities, to, to, they can be able to come to, well, American, European, and of course, mm -hmm. the great universities in India and China and, and in Israel, of course, and everywhere. So that's one thing. But even more that they, we can start build up a science infrastructure all over the world. So you get great universities, research universities all over the, the planet. I don't think, I think that's a possibility, but that's something that that's, uh, hasn't happened yet. We still know that most good research are being done by these big, rich universities. Mm -hmm. And when it comes... So that's one thing. And when it comes to the gender issue, I think also a very important question, why are so few women get the Nobel Prize? And the most obvious answer is that there is, there is a lag at, uh, in time for the Nobel Prize, that people who get the prize today are people who did their scientific work maybe 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then there were few women in science. For mm -hmm. example, this year, the Charpentier and Dodna, they made their work in the 2012 and there's two women and that's nothing strange about that because nowadays we see many more women in science so hopefully this will sort of correct itself but the Nobel committees also are aware of this problem because we want the prize to be or committees and everyone working with the prize wants the the prize to be inspirational and we want to show uh, people young people and the public that science is important but also that scientists are are interesting people and and it can be role models and then it's good to have a diverse uh, set mm -hmm. of laureates so we want that so we want to but 
they don't make the selection of laureates based on diversity, they make it on basis of science. But mm -hmm. what the committees can do is to make sure, just as they geographically, they specifically ask for more, want more, to target to get more, more nominations from places where they maybe don't get so many. Mm -hmm. They're also uh, asking, when they ask for nominations, asking, to, asking people to think that, we ask for you for nominate for this prize. Uh, we, uh, you can consider nominating. We are happy if, if you the nominee is a woman. Uh, that could be good if you include that. Mm -hmm. That won't get them the prize, but it's just, just think about that. And they also base this on psychological uh, behavioral science. One way that do this is people are prejudiced, and you know men nominate men. And even women try to nominate tend to nominate men more. But what they have done is now is to ask people who nominate, just not just to nominate one discovery or one candidate, but up to three. Mm. And that's uh, because then, because maybe someone who's nominated, you have the right to nominate, you don't have that right so often. So you want to pick a very obvious candidate. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, apparently that tends to be a man. But if you have two or three candidates, you include mm -hmm. more candidates, and then you get the more diverse set of nominee, uh, nominees. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with that. When you have a diverse set of nominees, it's easier to pick a diverse set of laureates, but it starts with the nominees. Mm -hmm. Now, Gustav, I'd like to just know if it is disclosable. Uh, what do these Nobel laureates get from the Nobel Foundation? Is it like medallion, certificate, prize money? If you can yeah. just share as much as you can for the audience, please. Yeah, yeah the laureates get uh, uh, 10 million Swedish kroner. That's roughly one... Um, 1 million euros or a little bit, uh, I think it's a little bit more, but roughly 1 million US dollars, something like that. So they get, to, uh, and if they share the price, they get half half of the money. And if it's three, they get usually a third. Um, but, uh, so if you want the money, you should get the literature price, because that's almost never shared, it's usually one lord, so go for that. But, um, so get money, and then you also get a gold medal, um, and you get uh, a diploma, which is sort of free, specifically for each laureate but the, the the gold medal is the gold value isn't that much it's um it's a, a quite big 18 karat gold medal so it's something but we know that some people sell we ask try to ask them not to but they do it anyway occasionally they sell their medals on auctions mm -hmm. and the, the value of a nobel medal is much higher than the value of the nobel prize itself so uh, monetarily <laughs> so so it's um, a quite valuable object to get as well. But they do get one gold medal that they can put in a, their vault or something to keep safe for safekeeping. They also can buy for a small sum um, two or three extra copies of the medal so they, they can sort of have in their pocket or have in their office and so on. So, so they can show it off. Mm -hmm. I know that several, many, many professors um, who get the Nobel Prize and then afterward, after this, they go out and give lectures they can always, you know, get some attention. Prefer if they have it in the pocket and they pick it up. And well, <laughs> maybe you know, professor of physics isn't used to people wanting to tell selfies with them. But when you pull up the Nobel Prize, you'll get a lot of selfie sticks coming out. That's true. And uh, after the announcement, is the relationship is over between you and the Nobel laureates or still you demand some social responsibility work for them to perform for you? Or you encourage them to do something for the sake of general people okay. or you still maintain the coordination and communication with them years after years? What's the mechanism? Yeah, we can't, we don't want to, and we can't force them to do anything. If not, nothing else for the matter that we don't ask if they want the prize, we just give them the prize. So they, when we call them, or, or when the Nobel committees call them, they just say that you have been awarded this year's prize. So you can't really decline a Nobel prize. So that's why we can't force them to do anything. They didn't ask for the prize. Uh, but we don't want to force them either. This is, we're we're happy to give them the prize. Mm -hmm. But we do, uh, since the Nobel Prize has a lot of outreach uh, activities, we do uh, lectures, we have organizations where we have, uh, one of the things that I think is really important that we do is we get Nobel laureates to meet with students, to mm -hmm. have conversations with them, to, 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 to inspire them. Uh, but we ask them to do that. We don't, they're not forced, they're, it's completely voluntarily by, done by, by the Nobel laureates. Uh, but they usually, and we try to keep in touch with them and so on, but they're usually quite um, open for this because what happens when you get the Nobel Prize is that you will get petitioned by everyone to make a statement, to do something good. And uh, 
sometimes you know talk about things that you don't know anything about or 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 sign petitions and so on but and many law nor lords they say no to a lot of this because they, they don't want to use their Nobel Prize to talk about something that they don't know mm -hmm. they, they're not authorities in but many Nobel lawyers also think that this is a prize for the benefit of humankind and they it makes them spokespersons for science uh, and for peace and literature so they want to use their prize for something and then for us it's we try to be there then we have these these things that we try to be a um, a safe place for them to go to this is so using us the nobel organization they can make statements and they know that this is a serious place to be it's not uh, we're not mm -hmm. using them to sell something or, or something like that mm -hmm. so and many many lawyers have others or other kinds of these circumstances they, they do things for their universities and for charities and so on but the mm -hmm. nobel is one of those things that's easy for them to say yes to so so i think that we have several laureates who, who uh, we're many who are, who are engaged with us and several who are, come back to us often because they like like this so so we don't but we don't force them to do it but we do try to keep a, a, a good relationship with them after all we're giving them a million us dollars and a gold medal so they like us <laughs> initially <laughs> but we don't want to squeeze we don't want to squeeze too much out of them either we want them to we especially we want them to enjoy their lives and 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 in several cases they don't have time to do anything that we want them to they don't they want to go back to their lab and do more science so yeah yeah, I understand. And you were just mentioning some of them do just voluntarily, uh, you know, lecturing. They just appear, like some, you know, lecture seminar with the students. So what you reckon now, we are in the year 2020 and we are having typical experience with COVID-19 and everything is going virtual. Uh, do you have any plan from the Nobel Foundation to conduct such type of sessions or webinars with these laureates or even the past laureates? Uh, kind of things like webinar, something coming up with the virtual world. Uh, I mean, overall, my question is, uh, are you considering any new initiative from the Nobel Foundation? Is there something new coming up in future other than simply the announcement of the prize? Yeah, the, we, we do. We have, uh, and I think we have an initiative that, that I think is, is very timely. And that is actually, um, where this pandemic has forced us to think in new ways that has actually probably made uh, our plans, uh, changed our plans, but made it in a way that will be more inclusive and reach more people. And that is a big meeting that we will hold in April next year, which is mm -hmm. called Our Planet, Our Future, um, uh, called the Nobel Prize Summit. And it's a meeting where we discuss with experts in different fields and Nobel laureates as spokespersons for science, where we try to discuss the fact that, that we live in a world now, which the pandemic, of course, has shown us that is very global and we really depend on each other. And where science plays, science and technology plays a very important role. So in this meeting, we want, um, uh, we highlight uh, three questions where this is very obvious, three um, long-term questions. And this is, of course, climate change. Um, it's uh, rising inequality in the world and it's uh, new technology and the applications and new technology both the promises of new technology but also the possible uh, problems for the new technology how do we implement new technology in uh, smart ways and uh, of course they all three is very goes very well together how do we implement new technologies in such a way that it benefits everyone not just the already rich but, but everyone in the world and how do we do it in a sustainable economic the uh, sorry, environmentally sustainable way so it's about creating a, a, a robust resilient world for the future and i think those kind of big issues where we have is, is nobel prize is, is we do this together it's a nobel prize foundation it's the national academy of sciences and it's the potsdam institute for climate um, action which is based in berlin and the National Academy of Sciences, of course, in Washington. So mm -hmm. this meeting will be based in Washington, D.C., but it will be, be digitized and we will have digital activities. So, so we reach everyone in the world. And having this digital has actually made it, I mean, rather than just reaching a few people in one spot, uh, and then maybe have some, some, some material output from this in the digital form, now everything will be digital. So we will reach more people and engage more people in the conversation that I think is right on target with, with what the Nobel Prize is all about, that science 
um, uh, well, as it says, as Alfred Nobel says, science for the benefit of humankind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, so very, very glad that you asked that because this is something that we work very hard on now and, and we think that this is a way to, uh, this is really what, what the Nobel Foundation is trying to do. Our main, the foundation's main task is of course to give out the prizes mm -hmm. and selecting the Nobel laureates. But then we also try to use uh, the standing and the status that, that this prize has also for the benefit of mankind. So we're doing from these very high level meetings with, with lots of participants, both Nobel laureates and scientific experts. We also have podcasts, it's one international podcast called the Nobel Prize Conversations, which is interviews with the Nobel laureates. I can recommend it, it's very enjoyable. Uh, I also do a podcast about Nobel Prizes, but in Swedish, so unfortunately. <laughs> so, but, but we also try to interact with our Swedish audience because that's really important mm -hmm. for us as well. So, so we really try for, from, from, the, from just reaching, you know, at, our, at the Nobel Prize, we see in Stockholm, we reach kindergarten kids to the high level meetings where we reach, try to reach politicians and leaders of nations. So we, we really, we have a very, uh, and that's a wonderful thing about working with the Nobel Prize that it's, we can actually do that. We, we have a, a name that is so, uh, a name and a symbol that stands for so much pos uh, positive things and that it's so recognizable uh, that um, uh, it opens many doors for us. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's also something where we try to be very careful to, to uh, we are stewards of this as well. So we try to be very careful about being, doing good things with it. So, so, but, but so far it's been going good. We'll yeah. see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Uh, Gustav, we are almost in the end of our show. I'm just going to ask you one more question regarding the museum. If you can tell us about the Nobel Museum, uh, what it is all about, uh, what sort huh? of thing sure. Yeah, the Nobel Museum, it's, uh, it's a museum about the Nobel laureates and their work um, and the discoveries. And it's... Uh, it, um, Quite, I would say, there is one thing that makes this museum very unique, and that's the stories of the Nobel laureates trying to get close to them. What we have done is, well, two things that I liked very much. One thing is we ask the Nobel laureates when they come to Stockholm, as they usually do, to give us something. Um, and we normally don't want, maybe, maybe it's not the you know, big scientific equipment we want, but something that has sparked their creativity. So how do you, we have all these ideas that has changed the world. We have ideas like this year, CRISPR and the hepatitis C virus and black holes. Um, but we also older prizes like graphene and, and DNA structure and, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And it's behind this, there is so much hard work. And these people have struggled sometimes uh, with lots of, of uh, obstacles in the way, but they have struggled and they have had these ideas what has kept them going, what's the inspirational. So that means that we have a collection of things on Nobel laureates. We have some microscopes, but we also have shoes, we have baseball gloves, we have uh, flies for fly fishing. We have uh, um, these Dutch clogs, these wooden shoes. We have so everything because, and every, every one of these objects tell a story about a discovery that has changed the world. So it's a, it's a wonderful way to, to, for, to, to do things I mean, we love doing these digital programs and pods and so on, but to get people to the museum where they can see these objects and they come closer to it. And after they've seen this and they've done this, they, they can go to our uh, restaurant and they can have lunch and they, they, then they can sit on chairs that have been signed by Nobel laureates. Every laureate, when they come to us and have lunch, they sign under the chair. So they have to stand up, turn the chair over, and then they sign their names. And it's wonderful. We can sit there and I, I, I remember I had a group of visitors there and I was showing them the museum. And then they sat down for dinner. And then when they were going out to get coffee, I said, well, when you rise now to get coffee, you can turn the chair around where you've been sitting, the chair you've been sitting on, and you can see who's, who else has sat on that chair. And all of them were quite excited. And they were sitting, oh, who's this? I'm sitting on this chair, someone who, you know, discovered a boson or something. And then one woman, she was really almost moved. She was like this. She was excited. And I said, well, so what is it? Is this really? Oh yeah, yeah, it is. I guess uh, it's really him. Oh, oh my God! I'm from Kenya to be sitting on the chair of Barack Obama. <laughs> so Barack Obama sat on that chair, and she was sitting on the same. So she thought that was really funny. Uh, so we can get. Then that's also one way to get sort of closer to this to these laureates. Um, so so it's, it's it, what it is is that 
the, it's a home for the Nobel Prize and it's a way to place where the where we can tell the stories of the Nobel laureates in a way that we're not able to in our in the various other programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we get we, we do talk, of course, very much about the work that they've done and the importance of their science and their their, their literary works and the, the peace work, but you also get closer to the people who actually do this and how they, their creative processes and so on. <laughs> it's a wonderful, it's a small and wonderful museum in Stockholm. Yeah, no doubt. It's a very, very great learning place for the future generations and generations after coming after, after years, after years, without a bound. That's uh, uh, Gustav Saltstrand. How's your experience on Channel 20's today's show? How did you feel? I feel <laughs> felt very good. It was a, I really enjoyed it. It was a great, great talk. Good, good questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, with Gustav's note, we are going to end up uh, today and we're going to see you on next show with the next uh, guest. Until then, stay tuned with Channel 20 and be safe wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you very much.